You probably heard the expression, who buys this? Or why was this comic just made for the creator? Well, this isn't a comics only situation. This happens all over the place. And it's not even that bad. It just, the consequences can't be. So let me explain about that. Hey everybody, it's Perch. Um, I think that the I always come out the gate really quick, like, hey everybody, it's Perch, and then like the I trail off. If you watch another video, you see like my brain just starts to wander at that point. Um, I get that catchphrase out, and it's like, no, where was I again? No, the but the the thing I want to talk about. So I think there's there's two sides to this this topic or this story, and it's it it's a complicated one because you want to kind of bite at the first part of the topic, but it's that second part. There's a, there's a follow-up that I think is a big deal. And that is, uh, it's, it's kind of the, who is this comic for? So there's a bunch of comics that get made where you read them and they're very, I don't want to say off-putting, but they're trying a different style. And in the 80s and the 90s, these comics existed all over the place. They were independent books and you would, you know, you'd pick them up and it wasn't really clear. You know, you'd, you'd know right away, this comic is for me, this comic is not for me. And generally speaking, they were more kind of, I'd say, intellectual style comics or more violent slash pornography comics. Those are the kind of the two camps. And you'd read it and you'd go, eh, you know, and, and to some extent, on a bigger sense, a lot of the Vertigo books are that way. You'd, they'd come out, you'd open it up, it would either catch you or it wouldn't. But, you know, for if you didn't like it, if it didn't catch you, you'd kind of just go two books over to the left on the shelf and you'd grab latest copy of Justice League or Avengers or Superman or The Flash or whatever, and you'd be on to the races. And there was a good designation between here are the indie books and here are, you know, for lack of a better word, the mainstream books. And what happened in a lot of cases is that, you know, the comic creators of today were the readers and the fans of, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And a lot of those reader and fans who wanted to join the comic industry were reading the indie books. They were not reading the mainstream books, or maybe they were reading the mainstream books, but they're really kind of their imaginations were ignited by the kinds of things that are going on in, in, um, in the indie titles. And so that's how they learned kind of their trade. That's how they got excited about comics and, and creating things and, and putting all that together. That's, that's where that whole momentum came from. So lo and behold, um, when, they get their time at bat when they actually become the comic creators, they're put onto mainstream books. And so the motivation of these creators is not to write a mainstream comic story. It's to take the flash and make it more like shade, the changing man from the nineties. That was what they really kind of wanted to do. They want to tell those kinds of, you know, mind expanding, mind blowing stories. And that's fine. Except the problem is when you know, the, the reason why they were good kind of mind expanding indie books is because you had the mainstream and you had a baseline of what comics were all about. Uh, and then you had these books that were challenging the norm. And once the books that were challenging the norm become the norm, it's not really good for anybody. It's not good for the indie books and it's not good for the norm either. Neither side really benefits from that, that, you know, result. So, you know, what happens next? I think the challenge we have with, uh, with comics and in things in general is that when you get a bunch of your mainstream books starting to tell a more indie story, then it starts to beg the question, who is this comic for anymore? And now to take it, take it away from comics, I mean, look, every author, every creator, every artist, every, you know, everyone has certainly created things that are for them or mapped to their interests rather than the mainstream. I think healthy creators do that. They, they, they don't want to just create what everybody else wants. They want to stretch their wings and do something unique. And that's, again, that's fine. But if everything kind of winds up that way, where you're creating a comic that's really relevant to yourself, then you have to kind of hope that the mass market is just like you. 
And if the mass market is just like you, are you a unique and creating, you know, creative snowflake anymore? I, here I'm meaning the snowflake term in terms of every snowflake is unique, not the, you know, snowflake with tender feelings version of the word. I'm talking, you know, if you grew up reading indie books because they were different and you prided yourself on looking at the world differently and being different, and then you write a mainstream comic book, either one of two things is going to happen. Either you discover you're not as unique and different as you thought, and the mainstream likes you, in which case, are you happy? You've now become the man. Or you create a comic that is for you, that maps to your sensibilities and what you like, and nobody else buys it and reads it, and in which case, you just created an indie comic book, which is cool unless you're writing, say, Superman, and in which case, Superman is not meant to be an indie comic book, and you've just tanked uh, a business. So that's that's this interesting dynamic. It's not necessarily bad or wrong. In fact, it, to the contrary, it's not bad or wrong at all for people to create things that are, you know, map them, that are, that are good for themselves. There's, there's again, there's, that's human nature. Nothing wrong with it. The only challenge is if that creating something for themselves gets paired up with, uh, with, <laughs> with the mainstream, in which case, you know, it's meant to be a mass-produced product. I think I'll put it to you another way. Um, what if, you know, just saying, what if somebody made a comic book or, or no, not a comic, forget comic books for a minute. What if somebody uh, loved super heavy garlic in their food? It was their favorite thing. So they made all their food with garlic, just tons, so much garlic that it was painful to eat. It was just like, it made your eyes water and it was just, it was just, just super, super hard to even digest this, this amazing concentration of garlic. Now let's say you're the um, kind of food manager for creating, I don't know, a food that everybody eats all the time. Let's, let's say, uh, say chocolate. Let's say you're, you're now in charge of making M&Ms. And your first action as head of that brand is to make uh, super, super garlic M&Ms. And let's, let's say you do that. You, you kill off and you kill off all the M&M flavors. All you're making is garlic M&Ms. And the people eat it, and it's absolutely disgusting. They they just they they reject. They won't eat it. It's it's awful. There, you, people are crying. Just you you've ruined a food that uh, you know a snack food that everybody loved. Okay, so now what? Um, basically, <laughs> if that happened, and then people are are trying to uh, to choke down your food, and you're going well, you know. I'm in charge. This is my creative vision. This is how it should be. And what if the company stood behind and say, well, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd really like to have M&Ms that sold really well. I'd love to have it be, you know, the number one kind of candy snack food that exists. But, you know, what can I do? I, I can't, you know, I can't stop this. I can't, uh, you know, it's not my place to tell somebody what their creative vision is. So I guess everybody will just have to eat these M&Ms. Um, that would, would that make any sense at all? Of course not. So, the comics, if you look at it the same way, I think that there there is certainly a, a place and a valuable place in the market for independent efforts, for unique comics, for new visions. I think that that is definitely a thing and a good thing that should happen. But I also think uh, equally important are mainstream big character selling books that are designed to appeal to a mass market. And if you think about it in the same way as food, the goal of of you know, candy and, and certain restaurant dishes and other things is to appeal to as many people as possible. True, a chef can go into a restaurant and have their style, but the chef also wants to get as many people in the restaurant uh, as they can. And a chef is an artist in the same way and a, a penciler or an inker for a comic book is an artist. They're both artists in their own way. They both have unique methods of doing what they do. And they, you know, they... they they're in charge of their own destiny. They they are hired and retained and promoted and succeed or fail based on their own abilities. And so, if you if you equate that to comics, um, it's you know, are you operating a little indie diner or are you operating a mainstream restaurant? It, there's a big difference between you know, Paris garlic French restaurant down. I like garlic by the way. I, I, for what it's worth, I would not eat a garlic even if that's disgusting. But you know, I like garlic just fine. But anyway, uh, 
if you've got this kind of, you know, Italian restaurant over here that is designed, you know, it can hold at most, you know, 12 people and it's really amazing food, very delicacy type food um, and all that. And then you've got across the street McDonald's. Um, you wouldn't go tell McDonald's, hey, stop making the hamburger and the french fries. And instead you need to, you know, have anchovies and caviar because that would kill their audience. So with comics, I, I, it's not an either or. I think there's a very good, very reasonable place for independent artists, independent creators, independent writers to create their vision, things that are in their soul, that represent them, that, are, that talk to an audience of them. I don't think those people should be discouraged or stopped or you know, can't make comics. But I think we need to start looking at the mainstream as a viable, unique, you know, independent thing itself. I think that, you know, if you're going to make a vision that is your vision of a character, then you need to either start a new book with your character you can, you know, pick up from the ground floor or do an indie book that is designed to appeal to a smaller audience. It, you know, like Neil Gaiman did Sandman, it wound up being pretty pretty good, um, appealing to a lot of different people. It's an example of an indie book that had enough mainstream sensibilities into it that was able to attract a mainstream audience. Or maybe it was just an indie book that was powerful and good enough that it attracted a lot of indie uh, fans and, and uh, enough of them that it became a strong selling book just by nature of, you know, it being, you know, a, a, a big totem or an avatar for uh, independent readers. I mean, that's fine too. It's like, you know, the, the, Nine Inch Nails or The Cure or Depeche Mode, uh, a lot of bands that date myself, uh, <laughs> those bands were considered, you know, alternative and in indie bands. And they certainly didn't sell as much as some of the, the giant mega bands at the time. I mean, Guns N' Roses outsold The Cure, but The Cure got enough popularity amongst alternative listeners and, and people who were into that, that you know, enough of them kind of banded together and bought it. And that can certainly happen for independent comic books too. But a product like Superman, a product like the X-Men or like uh, the Avengers or Captain America, Spider-Man, The Flash, Batman, those titles uh, have very defined histories. I mean, histories that are 50 years old or more, they've got licensing and IP attached to it. And no creator really wants to hear that. I mean, I, I know when you're hanging out with uh, your artist friends, and I've hung out with tons of artists before and, and writers and others, you know, they don't want to, you know, they, they don't necessarily ever want to admit that, hey, yeah, I, I do this. I did this mainstream job. I had to draw kind of characters in a very defined style. And uh, it wasn't really able to flex my artistic muscle, so to speak. I had to, you know, work within the confines of this box to create this character and, and do this, this art. And people are like, oh, well, I hope you get to do your own vision at some point. And I was like, yeah, me too. But guess who bought the drinks? It's the person who did the mainstream work because that's what's selling. And when I see creators or artists or others that are very successful over time, the successful ones are able to compartmentalize in their own minds the value of creating their own creation, their own artistic vision, versus um, putting out something that is a you know, very strong mainstream book that you know appeals to a lot of people. That doesn't, you know, maybe they sneak in little bits that kind of hit upon their own soul or whatever. But you know, that's there's. A big value in that. There's a big value in being able to put a book out, um, have it be relevant to many, many, many people, and that's not shameful. It's not taking away anything for yourself as an artist. Um, but there's also great value in putting out your own indie vision. It's just how we look at each one. And I think the comic industry has gotten muddled up at some point in the mid 2000s or so. Uh, there became a you know people kind of uh, lost the plot so to speak, where, you know, mainstream creators um, were allowed to kind of completely have autonomous control over their own creative vision of a mainstream book. And that, you know, I, that unfortunately, there should have been some editor in chief or somebody at the top going, hey, hang on a second, you know, we still got a line to control, we have, a, we still have a brand to protect. And I know those words are all oh, gross, uh, to a lot of uh, people in the creative industry. But it's, it's what, creates the backbone that allows the industry to survive. I mean, 
the reason why Vertigo did so well back in the you know 80s 90s is because it sat next to you know it it literally stood on the shoulders of giants. There were big you know huge selling books there. I mean, it, put it this way: people customers coming in wanting their copy of Young Blood or Wildcats, and then you know kind of coming to the conclusion on their own. You know, you four people come in to buy Young Blood. And one of those people are like, you know what? This comic sucks. There's no story here. It's just kind of dumb art. The backgrounds aren't present. There's no feet. You know, whatever it might be. This comic is terrible. And it's like, I'd like to find something with a little bit more craftsmanship. And it's like, well, what's this, you know, right here? It's Preacher or Sandman or, you know, one of these titles that actually is more mature, does take things a little bit more seriously. And the fact that you had, though, a very strong backbone of mainstream books allowed stores to open and carry the indie books and it brought in customers and of every 10 customers two would branch off and go for these indie books and so it brought that audience up but if you take the mainstream and you make it niche then you know everything fails the mainstream sales go down the indie books sales go down because there aren't as many people coming into the shop there aren't enough people who are wanting to kind of evolve and mature in some of these other titles so that's that's kind of the challenge that we have right now in the comic industry is, you know, there's a there's a time and a place for everything, and I do believe all these different versions and visions and books um, can appeal to people, to to you know either individuals or big groups. And I think it's just a matter of, you know, in a comic industry, we have to understand which is which. We have to be able to to make that distinction. And today it doesn't seem like we're we're doing that very well as an industry. Anyway, I hope this all made sense. I, what do you think? Leave your comments below um, in this in this video. I, I think it's a tough topic because people jump on here and they go, oh, all those, you know, the SJW riders should all just be fired from everything. It's like, well, or they should, uh, you know, they should just be, the people who are doing books that don't feel like they're mainstream should stick to kind of indie titles. I mean, there's a big reason, by the way, why some of the writers who had very successful runs with indie books and then were hired onto Marvel and, you know, jumped on and did, you know, big, you know, the X-Men or big titles like that. And then it's like, well, this feels really wrong for the X-Men. This doesn't feel like a good X-Men book. And it didn't work. And it's because they were attuned to doing that independent book of their own. And they, they should stay there, honestly, or kind of wrap their head around the idea of creating something for the mainstream, you know, use that auto tune. Make yourself sound great, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, like, subscribe, click the bell for notifications. Follow me on Twitter at Comic Perch. Thank you for listening.